He wants me to tell you what he's saying word for word. Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. <laughs> Hello again, scholars, and welcome to this, another episode of Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger, a professional artist, master educator, attempting to bring you the best in art historical content. If you like this one, please do me a favor, interact with the video. Much appreciation for your effort. <laughs> this is going to be cool. You wouldn't believe how long it's taken, but I've been thinking about the ancient wonders of the world for quite some time. And uh, I've been planning a video on it. I've been researching all of these seven structures. It's taken a lot of time, a lot of work. Oh, who cares? It's showtime! Do, 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 do. Here we go. So what exactly are the seven wonders of the ancient world? This bizarre list of sites consists of two statues, two tombs, a temple, a lighthouse, and a garden. This seemingly random hodgepodge of places of interest has lots of influence on today's 21st century world, and they very much had influences at the times that they were created. Like all of my videos, I try to do a lot of research, and most of my research comes from four basic sources. Some are more credible than others. But as is typical, the truth typically lies somewhere in the middle. My first source is Diodorus of Sicily, who is a historian and writer of the Historical Library. Poet Antipater of Sion is my second source who witnessed all of the Seven Wonders, arguably the father of history. Herodotus, in his book The Histories, very much chronicles a lot of these things. And, lastly, not leastly, Calamascus of Cyrene. He was the chief librarian at the Library in Alexandria and he would help develop this first list of major sites to behold in the ancient world. These sources really work together to create the Makta, or a list of sites that really needs to be taken in and seen. These lists would evolve, some included some, some included others, but this is basically the compiled list of seven. Why seven? because the Greeks felt that seven was the perfect, most ultimate number, and so because it's the perfect number, they used the number seven. So we use the number seven, everyone uses the number seven. That's just it, unless you get to number eight. And there are many things that represent the so-called eighth wonder of the world, from the Empire State Building, the Astrodome, the Statue of Vulcan, King Kong, Andre the Giant, all eighth wonders of the world, but I digress. <laughs> Hey, how about getting your, how about getting your foot off my shoulder? Ah. Hey. This list of seven wonders only existed on the planet at the same time for a total of 54 years. And because of that very small window of time where they all existed at the same time, and travel was not global at that time, information was not global at that time, the list is very narrow, but at the same time, their influence was very broad. So let's get right down to it. How are we going to present these seven wonders? And uh, like, what's the what's the format here? Four seasons, seven wonders. Ooh, four seasons and seven wonders. That sounds intriguing. Let's get into the first of the seven wonders then. The Temple of Artemis. This temple was a place of worship for the Greek goddess Artemis, the goddess of the hunt, the goddess of wildlife, the looter goddess. This was a place that housed many, many works of art, and people from all across the region of Greece, the Greek Empire, would come to visit and worship and behold this great piece of architecture. It was a marvel. They would come to the city of Edifice, the place where this was built, which is in modern-day Turkey. It was built here because they had a very prosperous seaport that allowed a lot of travelers and goods and things to come in. And Tapeter of Sion, the one that created the list of the seven wonders of the ancient world, said that this was the most magnificent, the most marvelous, and the most beautiful of all of the uh, seven wonders. It would take 10 years of construction to build this thing, 
and they say that this is the first Greek temple to be built out of marble. This was a pretty good sized structure. It was 377 feet long, 151 feet wide, and it had 40 foot tall columns built in the 7th century BC. This thing was built on some swampy land because they believed that the swampy land would allow it to have a cushion that would protect it from earthquakes that were prevalent in this area. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but that's what they say. Anyway. Now this thing was rebuilt twice. The first time it was rebuilt because of a flood. A flood came in, destroyed the whole thing. Second time, an arsonist came in, burnt the thing down to the ground because he wanted to have his name uh, forever embedded into history. And so we will not mention his name because it would give uh, it would give too much clout to his dastardly deed. Now, the act of arson was committed on the actual day that Alexander the Great was born. And according to the legend, this was a symbol that Artemis was taking favor with the Macedonians and Alexander the Great. And he would rise to great power, as most of us know. And when he would take control of this region, he ordered that it was to be reconstructed. Now, they didn't reconstruct it right away, but after he died, they did rebuild it. The last time it was torn down, uh, the Christians had deemed that pagan religions should be um, removed from the, the, the country, from the, the civilization. And so the Christians said, let's tear this thing down. It was torn down and the beautiful white marble, the best in all of the world, perhaps, was uh, repurposed into other building projects. Side note, legend says that when this thing finally went down that the materials were used to build the Hagia Sophia in modern day Istanbul. But that's just a legend that's not actually true. But people believe that, so there it is, but it's not real. Anyway, parts of this story are told in the Bible, in the book of Acts. They do talk about the temple and edifice that would be torn down, and it is accounted for in the biblical theologies. All right, what's wonder two? Let's look at the lighthouse at Alexandria. Alexandria was a key trade hub of the ancient world. After Alexander the Great's death, Ptolemy takes control of the city in this basic region and ordered the construction of this great big lighthouse on the island of Pharos in the 3rd century BC. It would take quite some time, roughly 12 years to be exact, to construct this thing, and the completion of the project was overseen by the successor of Ptolemy, his son, Ptolemy II. So imagine this, way out there, there's an island. And on that island, let's say they built the lighthouse there. Now you have to have a way to get there. So they built a long causeway from the land to that island. This lighthouse was constructed out of white granite and marble and would have been one of the tallest structures in the ancient world. The signal at the very top was able to shine out 29 miles from the lighthouse. Now what are the dimensions on that thing? 330 feet tall with a 98 foot square base with three tapering tiers to achieve that level. At the very tippity top there would have been a statue of Poseidon this thing was destroyed by three earthquakes. After that, it was left to ruin. It was simultaneously shut down, then kind of gotten away from, and just allowed to erode into the waters. At the time of its complete destruction, it basically mostly was submerged into the ocean, but what was left above the waterline was used to build the citadel of Quet Bay in 1477. This is the third longest surviving of the wonders of the ancient world, only surpassed by the mausoleum at Halicarnassus and the Great Pyramid at Giza. All right, here comes number three, the Great Pyramid of Giza. Previously, I've constructed a video on the Great Pyramid, but I'm gonna give you some of the information on this one at any rate. This is the only of the seven wonders that still remains in existence to this day. It was built sometime between 2580 and 2560 BC as a tomb that was going to be for the pharaoh at the time, Khufu. The base of this thing would cover 13 square acres. It holds over 91 million cubic feet of material, including 5.5 million tons of limestone, 8,000 tons of granite, 
and 500,000 tons of mortar to hold it all together. This would be the tallest man-made structure for over 3,800 years after it was constructed. This thing was a giant, 482 feet tall. That's high! On average, one block had to be put in place every five minutes, 24-7, 365 days a year. This is the first of these seven wonders that was actually constructed. And it took 26 years for this thing to be constructed. The largest stone structure ever built. And contrary to popular belief, there were no slaves that were used in the construction of this structure. Now, if you want a little bit more information on Egypt, check out my video on the subject. All right, which one's next? The Statue of Zeus. This statue was created in 435 BC and would have been 40 feet tall and housed in a temple at Olympia. Sitting on his pine throne, Zeus himself would have been constructed out of ebony, gold, and ivory on top of a wooden armature. In his hands, Zeus holds the goddess of victory in his right hand and in his left a scepter that had a resting eagle at the top. This thing was so magnificent that everybody would come around and pilgrimage to see this thing. It was created by Phidias. He was also the creator of the statue of Athena in Athens in the uh, Parthenon. News of this thing eventually reached the emperor of a time, Caligula. At any rate, he ordered for this statue to be removed and moved to Rome so it could be rebuilt and reconstructed only with his head to be sculpted at the top instead of Zeus's head. Thanks a lot, Caligula. But that never happened because... On January the 24th, 41 AD, before the order could be carried out, Caligula was assassinated, so it didn't go forward. However, in 391 AD, Theodosius would order for all of these pagan temples to be shut down, including this temple in Olympia. And as it just sat there and rotted away, the statue would be removed and taken to Istanbul, where according to one story, it was destroyed in a fire in a makeshift museum in 475. But others believe that it was just left there to rot away and was eventually just plundered and hacked to bits by people that were coming through. And there are many, many influences that this would have from the sculpture of George Washington from 1840, Daniel French used this as inspiration for his Abraham Lincoln. Now we're over halfway there, what's next? The Mausoleum at Halicarnassus. This construction originally began when the region was in the control of the Persian Empire. However, parts of it were also constructed during a time when the region was under the control of Alexander the Great. It was built in 353 in what is now modern day Turkey. This mausoleum at Halicarnassus was created for King Mausolus, who ruled this region from 377 to 353 BC. And the project began the same year that he died. But the construction was carried out by his wife, who was also his sister, Artemisia. Essentially, this is an above-ground tomb. This rectangular tomb was 100 feet by 120 feet rectangular, had a circumference of 440 feet, would climb 140 feet tall, and there would be a series of platforms that led up to the top tomb that was roofed by a 24-step platform that went up to a sculpture of a chariot with four horses, and on the top in the chariot was a statue of King Mausolus and his wife's sister Artemisia. At 148 feet tall, it was at that time one of the tallest structures on the planet. This was created out of white marble. There were many, many decorations around it, including low relief sculptures and sculptures in the round that were created by many of the best sculptors of the time, including Timotheus, Scopas, Leocares, and Bryaxis. 36 sculptures were included at the top of all of the family members. Now, we don't know who the actual individuals are, but these are believed to be Mausolus and Artemisia. However, it could have been any of their male and female relatives. The decorative reliefs around the mausoleum included one of the battle between the Athenians and the Amazons, and another that was a battle with the Senators. 
the earthquake would topple this thing in the 13th century AD, specifically in 1494. A couple hundred years later, the Crusaders would come in and use those stones to build the Castle of St. Peter. We can see the columns and the parts of the marble that were used right there in the side of this Castle of St. Peter. Originally, this castle was called Petronium, but another way to say Petronium is Bodrum. And the modern name of the city that once was Halicarnassus is now Bodrum. So they would rename the town to the name of the castle. So, there's that. Yes. This sculpture would influence lots of things in the future, including the Mausoleum of Hadrian. But strangely, we don't know the Mausoleum of Hadrian as the Mausoleum of Hadrian. We know the Mausoleum of Hadrian as the Castel St. Angelo, which is a tomb fortress in the Vatican City. So yes, they turned the tomb into a castle fortress. Isn't it strange how that happens? Alright, now what's next? The Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Basically, this is a mountain of mud bricks. Allegedly, supposedly, according to lore, was built in the city or near the city of Babylon. One of my sources indicates that this was built alongside of the palace, known as the Marvel of Mankind, which was the primary palace to Nebuchadnezzar II and his wife, Amidus. According to the common belief, it was constructed by the orders of King Nebuchadnezzar II for his wife, Queen Amethyst. Uh, she came from a mountainous region and then had to migrate to a, uh, a more desert type area because of her marriage and she missed the mountains, she missed the countryside and so um, she was built this great palace, the Hanging Gardens, to be filled with trees and plants and vines and, and uh, irrigation systems to water the whole thing and that's why it was where it was. Again, only one of the ancient writers would indicate and associate Nebuchadnezzar II with this hanging garden in Babylon. And it is possible that the individual is mistaken on some of the facts. Because Babylon actually means Gate of the Gods, which applied to many cities in this region. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon is the only one of the seven wonders of the ancient world whose existence is in debate among historians. The root of the story that links Nebuchadnezzar II with the Hanging Gardens comes from a Babylonian priest from Madoc by the name of Barassus, who was the source of a source, those now lost sources in the middle, twisted and manipulated the story so now we can't find the Hanging Garden, or the story got so contorted to lead us there. Anyway, archaeologists can find no evidence that this was ever built in Babylon. However, its existence does fit with the classic accounts and modern records that best fit with a completely different ruler in a completely different area. Most note that Sennacherib was a powerful king that had built this huge terraced mountain of a garden in an area that is near modern day Mosul. And because of this conflict of, of who's right and who's wrong and where is it and where is it not and who built it and who didn't, archaeologists have just kind of thrown up their hands and disagree whether it existed at all. However, there has to be some root to its existence because I don't think they would have just made it all up. I think that someone was just confused when including it into the list. It's a little case of mistaken identity. Last but not least... The Colossus of Rhodes. The Colossus of Rhodes was in the city of Rhodes, which is on the island of Rhodes, and so there you have it. This is the wonder that actually survived for the least amount of time, from the time that it was put up to the time that it fell down. It was only in existence for about 54 years. It was created in the 3rd century BC, again, in the city on the island of Rhodes. The Colossus would have stood 110 feet tall. The Colossus was built in the likeness of the sun god, Helios. And according to archaeologists, this thing would have stood with his feet together. Now during the Renaissance, well after this thing was down into the harbor, it was depicted straddling between two islands on the harbor. Not true. 
Number one, it would have made it more difficult to get into the seaport where it was alleged to stand. The construction would have caused the port to be closed down, which would not have happened. And it would have been very difficult to build it there in the first place, so three strikes you're out. An earthquake caused the statue to snap at the knees, and it would have fallen onto the ground and crushed some of the buildings that were underneath it. The idea was kind of floated out there to rebuild it, but an oracle refused to allow it to be rebuilt, and so it just kind of laid there for about 900 years. Anyway, they kind of got tired of just watching it lay there, so they decided to sell it off as scrap metal. And according to the legend, it took 900 camels to haul off all of this melted-down colossus. There are several visible influences of this that we can find in our history, including the Colossus of Nero that was built in 65 AD, and more closely to home, the Statue of Liberty. The Colossus of Rhodes and the Statue of Liberty actually stood at the exact same height, minus the base. They would have had the same crown, and they are both kind of a salute to the sun god Helios. I tell you what, friends, I don't know about you, but I love that story. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for the thumbs up. Appreciate it. You have a good day. Mister, you better find yourself another line of work. This one sure don't fit your pistol.